Key point one. We live in a world of habits. Cell phones are a massive part of our lives. Most check them at every opportunity. You probably check yours within 15 minutes after waking up. We are addicted. In other words, hooked. We can't get enough social media because companies that produce apps know how to make them our habit. They affect the user's behavior with hooks, carefully designed experiences that help form habits. Secrets to building habits have been guarded for years since it's such a powerful tool. Nir Eyal studied related topics in psychology and behavioral economics and published his observations in his blog. With the help of his readers, he got many examples and found a pattern. He came up with the hook model, consisting of four steps. 1. Trigger. A cue like a notification or an email that sets off an action. 2. Action. A behavior, for example, clicking a link. 3. Variable reward. A pleasant result that feels new every time. And 4. Investment. The user's input, time, money, data, etc. Companies have been forming habits in customers, significantly affecting their life experiences. The hook model can bring positive change when used correctly. It describes linking a user's problem to a company's solution. Remember, we have access to more information than ever. The speed at which we can get data provides ample opportunities to establish healthy habits. In this summary, we'll discuss this model in detail, so you can apply it to build a successful habit-forming product. Did you know? Habits are actions you perform unconsciously, following situational cues. Key Point 2 You can increase your company's value by making your product part of customers' routines. At their core, habits are a tool your brain uses to automate specific actions, so you don't waste more energy contemplating every step, which can benefit your business massively. Of course, this strategy applies to products customers use constantly. Increasing the company's value means maximizing customer lifetime value, or CLTV, profits customers bring while using the product or service. Customers' habits increase engagement, and therefore CLTV. Keep in mind that products that become part of customers' daily routines have an immense advantage. We are all familiar with the QWERTY keyboard, and few use an alternative layout. But QWERTY fits the specific needs of a typewriter from the 19th century. Even though the alternatives proved more efficient, users stick with QWERTY purely because of habit. Customers will choose habit-forming products over superior competitors. Also, once consumers use the product regularly, they'll be more willing to pay for extra features. The main challenge in changing behavior is that old habits, the human brain, revert to previous behavior quickly. Therefore, while designing a product, it's crucial to consider how often the customers use it and how useful they find it. These two factors determine if your product is habit-forming. Take a look at what problems your business solves. The job of painkillers is to give us relief. We can't go on with our day without them. However, we don't feel the effects of vitamins. We take them because we're supposed to. Investors often ask which one your company is to know what customers' needs you'll address. Habit-forming products are both. They act like vitamins at first. It doesn't hurt to use the product, but you can live without it. But once the customer forms a habit, the product addresses a specific pain or itch. Designing such products requires manipulation, which we'll cover later. Habits differ from destructive addictions and can be healthy and helpful. Follow this summary and dig deeper into each step of building habits so you can create a product people love and use regularly. Key Point 3 You can make your product a habit by knowing why your customers use it. The first step to a habit is a trigger, a cue that makes you take action. There are two types of triggers. The first one, external, clearly tells the user what to do. Every bright login button you see is a trigger. External catalysts can be different. Paid triggers are advertisements. While they may be effective at first, relying on them long-term is costly and unsustainable. Earned triggers, such as viral videos or press coverage, are free, but the attention they gain for the company fizzles out quickly. Relationship triggers use word of mouth and shares on social media, which requires a user base excited enough to share a good word about the product. Owned triggers are shown to users who opt into seeing them. These are regular newsletters and notifications. While external triggers can jumpstart a new habit, internal stimuli keep that habit afloat. Internal triggers are not material. They are all about thoughts and emotions. For example, many people post on Instagram to save a special moment. 
the fear of losing this moment triggers users to share pictures. Keep in mind that when we feel an emotional itch that a particular product can scratch, our mind associates that emotion with the product. A product relieves a customer's pain, so you must identify it in this step. Be careful and avoid jumping to the features. First, describe this pain from an emotional standpoint. Surveys usually prove ineffective because users don't speak in the terms you need. You must ask people what they do to find out what they want. Develop a clear image of your target audience down to their daily routine. Try the five whys method. Ask why the user wants to use the product until you get to the emotion that triggers them. You might think someone wants to use email because they need to send and receive messages. But once you dig deeper, you'll see they want to talk with their friends because they're afraid to lose touch. Now that you know the base trigger, fear, you can look for a way to solve it with your product. Key point four. Make your product intuitive and motivate users to act. A trigger is only successful when the action comes next, the second step in the hook model. Acting requires three crucial components, motivation, the ability to complete the action, and a trigger. Let's look closer at each one. Dr. B.J. Fogg, director of the Persuasive Technology Lab at Stanford University, suggests that people have three core motivations, each with two poles, pleasure versus pain, hope versus fear, and acceptance versus rejection. While we chased one pole, we ran away from the other. Next, the ability to complete a task faster will drive them to the product. Remember that the less effort a task takes, the more likely we can end it. So, when designing a product, remove unnecessary steps to up user management. Focus on these six elements to make the desired action easier. Time, money, mental effort, physical labor, acceptance of behavior in society, and disruption of the user's routine. You want to minimize how much of these resources a user spends. For example, Google ranked pages on how often other websites link them, so it took less time and effort to find relevant search results. The mind takes shortcuts informed by our surroundings to make quick and sometimes erroneous judgments. Near eall. While these principles are easy to grasp, sometimes our minds are unpredictable. A few brain biases can influence people's behavior and push them toward action. These are called heuristics, cognitive shortcuts we take to reduce decision-making to essentials. For instance, scarcity increases the product's value in the user's view. People are more compelled to buy an item when they know there's a limited amount left. Another way to influence the perception of value is by placing it into a different context, the framing effect. If the world's best violinist plays in a subway, they won't get as much attention as they would in a fancy concert hall. It's helpful to consider heuristics during the designing stage to make your product easy to use, thus increasing its habit-forming potential. Key point five. A variable reward system keeps the users engaged. Once the user completes an action you need them to do, they expect a reward, which is the third step. Research by Brian Knutson, a Stanford professor, shows that a particular part of the human brain responds to rewards. However, our biggest motivator isn't the pleasure of receiving the prize, but the relief of fulfilling a craving for it. The essential quality of an effective reward is variability. No matter how excited a child is about a toy, there comes a time when they stop playing with it because it becomes predictable. Don't forget, novelty brings your attention to mundane things. Making an experience feel new can boost our motivation to complete tasks. There are three types of variable rewards, the tribe, the hunt, and the self. Rewards of the tribe are social. They bring a sense of belonging. This type is the reason for social media's success. You never expect to see the same page when you log into Facebook. Each time you find new pictures, posts, and comments. Novel rewards for logging in and using the service. Rewards of the hunt are rooted in pre-agrarian societies where hunters chase their prey for hours before killing it. This pursuit was crucial for humanity thousands of years ago and has remained in our lives in different forms. We scroll through Twitter looking for an entertaining tweet. On Pinterest, images appear on a page in a way that cuts off some pictures at the bottom, so we keep scrolling to get the reward of the full image. Reward of the self is the joy of finishing a task. This type of reward is prevalent in video games, reaching a new level or completing a quest. While these rewards are a powerful tool, they must fit in the product's purpose. Mahalo was a Q&A forum website. The reward system seemed perfect. Users gained money for participating. However, making money was different from the user's goal for using the site. 
When Quora, a similar competing product, appeared on the market, it allowed the users to vote for answers, which proved to be a more effective way to retain users. In Quora's case, social rewards matched the user's behavior. Key point six. Users' labor makes them love the product more. We are finally at the last step of the hook model, investment. Unlike action, investment doesn't provide immediate gratification. Instead, it promises future rewards. The more users invest time and effort into a product or service, the more they value it. Near all. People put more value on things that require their labor or consistency. This phenomenon is called the IKEA effect. IKEA customers have to assemble the furniture themselves, making them emotionally attached to the product. We also tend to change our behavior to avoid having conflicting ideas. Although our mind is supposed to reject spicy food and alcohol, we see others like it, so we develop a taste for it over time. These behaviors make us rationalize some actions with reasons someone else instilled in us. We know spending money to progress in a lame game isn't the best idea, so we convince ourselves the game is good and investing is wise. Remember, the investment phase shows users an increasing value of the product. The more resources they put in, the better the service. Unlike a physical product, the software can improve based on user feedback. Such a product has the advantage of stored value. Users who add content to their library will likely use the software again. Not only do they have their favorite playlist there, but the software's recommendations also get better. Now that the first cycle is complete, rinse and repeat. To make your product a habit, you need a trigger to start the following process, which can happen during the investment phase. Tinder makes you invest time to look through profiles, which increases the chance of finding a match, and therefore receiving a notification. The next trigger. Investment into a product makes customers return to it regularly without question. This engagement discourages users from switching to a competitor. Did you know, an average Snapchat user in 2013 would send around 40 photos daily, which adds up to over 200 million photos shared across the app. Key point seven. Be aware of your effect on the customers. While listening, you might have thought this advice feels manipulative or controlling. While the core purpose of the hook model is to affect people's behavior, use it with caution. Remember, most technology we use is persuasive, and we haven't developed a way to avoid these addictive products on a societal level. Some think designers should follow an ethical code, while others believe deception can be good if the result is positive. Near Eall suggests a manipulation matrix to assess the morality of manipulation needed to build your product. First, ask yourself if you would use the product. Second, would it have a positive impact on users' lives? Based on the answers, you can fall into one of four categories. Note that you must be confident in your response. If you answer yes twice, you're the facilitator. You can help build healthy habits, thus bringing positive change. The peddler makes a helpful product but doesn't use it. They try to gamify tasks by rewarding users with points that don't mean much to users. The peddler's projects fail because they need insight into their users' needs. The entertainer uses their product, which does not improve people's lives. Entertainment is important but fleeting. Once the user loses interest in a piece of content, it requires the next big hit to capture their attention again. The entertainer has to be able to keep up with the customer's demands. And finally, the dealer builds a product that doesn't improve anyone's life and doesn't use it. When the maker answers no to both questions, exploitation is at the core of their business. The designer wants to hook people in to make money from their addictions. However, dealers rarely enjoy long-term success. Identifying which type of innovator you are can give you a glance into how your product would affect the customers. After all, you will face moral repercussions accordingly. Whether you start your own company or join a business, aligning its values with your moral compass is helpful. Conclusion Now that you have grasped the hook model, you can use this advice to identify your product's weaknesses and take advantage of its habit-forming potential. You have the necessary tools to create a prototype. Of course, you'll know if your product's habit-forming once someone uses it. When testing your product, consider how often the customer uses it, whether you have factual data or by making realistic assumptions. You also want to identify which actions encourage devoted users to engage with the product repeatedly. Then, adapt the product to motivate the rest of the user base to repeat those actions. Facebook's user base first consisted of Harvard students before going mainstream. Now, with millions of users, it's one of the most successful software products.
This case shows that a niche product can become very popular if you understand the customer's needs and modify features accordingly. Most importantly, examine your needs and preferences as it's the best way to gain insights into the customer's psyche. Monitoring your behavior can lead to the most valuable breakthroughs. Finally, keep going if the process takes longer than expected. Building an effective habit-forming product requires patience and determination. Keep learning and adapting to create a product enjoyed by many users daily. Try this. Go through the steps of the hook model and ask these questions. What pain do users want to relieve when using the product? What incites them to use the product? What actions do they take to get rewarded? Can you simplify them? Do users enjoy the rewards? Do they crave more? What do they invest in? Is the investment phase the start of the next hook?